Mountains and College of Science, Engineering, Mathematics, who are all sponsoring this event, so thank you. Uh, our admissions department, which uh, is working uh, behind the scenes today, and so thank you for, to them. WVUT, who is live streaming uh, this right now, as well as uh, will be showing it uh, at later dates on their station. Uh, also would like to thank Sarah Wolf, who's the director of the uh, uh, Knox County Vincennes Eclipse group, uh, organizing the Dark Side of the Wabash event, also part of the Knox County Chamber and Tourism Bureau. So thank you, Sarah. And it's her birthday today. Um, <laughs> I, I promised I wouldn't embarrass her. Um, and then uh, also thanks to First Vincent Savings Bank and just welcome to our media guests who are also covering this. Okay, now uh, just to introduce our speaker, Fred Espinak. Fred Espinak is a retired astrophysicist from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center where he worked with infrared instruments to probe the atmospheres of the planets. He is also known as Mr. Eclipse because of his work on predicting and observing solar eclipses. He has written over two dozen books on eclipses, including his most recent Eclipse Bulletin, Total Solar Eclipse of 2024, April 8th. Over the past five decades, he has witnessed dozens of solar eclipses from all over the world. The International Astronomical Union honored Espinac by naming an asteroid after him in 2017, the U.S. Postal Service used one of his eclipse photos on a stamp to commemorate the most recent total eclipse through the USA. So I give you uh, Fred Espinac and Experiencing Totality. Let's see, our video seems to have gone out. Well, everything was working until we started. Yeah. There it goes. There it is. Okay. Perfect. All right. There's always some technical glitches. Well, today is February 8th, two months from today is the total solar eclipse. And Vincennes is right in the front row for the most spectacular natural event you can see with the naked eye. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll talk about the eclipse in a little bit. But I want to start with some basics and talk about uh, some geometry of the solar system. Well, this disk here represents the sun. And it's a little hard to see, but way up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little blue dot. That is the Earth to scale with the sun. The, sun is, the sun's diameter is... 109 times the diameter of the Earth. To put it another way, if the, Earth, if the Sun were hollow, you could put over a million Earths inside of it. So the Sun is enormous. Now here's the Earth again. The Sun down there is right at the, at the bottom. It looks like a, a flat line, but that's the Sun on the same scale. It's so enormous. And to the right of the, moon, of the sun, of, of the earth, is the moon, to scale. 
So the moon is about one quarter the size of the Earth. So Earth and moon are much closer in size to each other than the sun is. So it makes you wonder if the moon is able to completely pass between in the Earth and the sun and completely cover the sun's disk when the moon is much, much smaller, we have to have a very unique set of geometry. And that is, even though the moon is 400 times smaller in diameter than the sun, it's 400 times closer to the Earth. So it just happens to look the same size in the sky as we see from our surface of our planet. So the moon com can completely block the sun's surface during an eclipse. Let's look at that geometry, but first I want to talk a little bit about the basic orbit of the moon around the Earth. The moon orbits the Earth once every 29 and a half days with respect to the sun. And that's what we call the synodic month, astronomers call it, the synodic month. And during that 29 and a half days, the moon passes through all its phases. And you'll notice that the new moon is taking place when the, when the moon is between the Earth and the sun in this direction. And full moon is on the opposite side. Can we turn the lights down just a little bit? Make it easier to see the screen. Okay, so there's full moon over there is in the opposite side and from the surface of the Earth, what you're seeing are the various phases. Now the moon doesn't give off any light of its own. It's a cold, rocky body. The only reason we see the moon in the sky is because it's illuminated by, illuminated by reflected sunlight from the sun itself. Same thing that causes day and night on the Earth causes us to see the surface of the moon. So when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, the illuminated side is pointed away from us, and the moon is dark. We don't see it at all. We call that new moon. On the other hand, when the moon is full in the nighttime sky, that's the time that we have lunar eclipses, because it's at that time the moon can actually swing through the Earth's shadow, and the sunlight gets blocked off of the moon, and it's only illuminated by indirect light filtering through the Earth's atmosphere, and it turns that beautiful red color. In comparison, solar eclipses can only occur during the new moon, when the moon is passing between the Earth and the sun. Now, the moon has two shadows. There's the outer shadow called the penumbra, which is a partial shadow, and an inner shadow called the umbra. Now, the penumbra is much larger. It's over 4,000 miles wide. The Earth itself is 8,000 miles in diameter. So the penumbral shadow is almost half the, or a little over half the diameter of the Earth. And it covers a large area, no, you know, essentially the size of a continent or more. But the umbral shadow, that inner umbral shadow, is very small by the time it reaches the surface of the Earth. It's typically only 100 or 150 miles wide. And as the moon is orbiting the Earth during a solar eclipse, that umbral shadow sweeps across the Earth's surface and it produces a path of totality. You've got to be inside that narrow path. Again, it's only 100 or 150 miles wide, typically. You've got to be inside that narrow path to see the moon completely block the sun's surface. Otherwise, if you're in the large, much larger penumbral shadow, you only see a partial eclipse. And that's visible from a much larger area of the Earth because the penumbral shadow was so much larger. Well, what's so special about a total eclipse besides the fact that the sun's disk is completely blocked? During a total eclipse, with the sun completely obscured by the moon, the sun's glorious outer atmosphere, 
the solar corona is revealed. It's the only time you can see it because it's much fainter than the surface of the sun. And it's there in the sky every day, but the, sun, the, sky, the sky is filled with, with sunlight reflected off our atmosphere. And the, the corona is very pale and it's washed out by the brightness of the sky. This corona is a superheated plasma. It's like two million or three million degrees uh, Kelvin or, or centigrade. And at those temperatures, atoms are ripped apart into ions. They're magnetically charged and they flow along the magnetic fields of the sun and produce these exquisite fine details, polar brushes and streamers. And the magnetic fields of the sun are constantly changing. We go through an 11 year sunspot cycle of magnetic activity. And as we go through that various cycles, the shape of the corona changes, the, the structures change, the streamers change. So the corona looks different at every single eclipse. But this has only been known for the past couple hundred years. Well, when we talk about this geometry of solar eclipses, it might bring up a question. If we have, uh, if we can only have a solar eclipse during new moon, and we have a new moon every 29 and a half days, why don't we have a solar eclipse once a month? And the answer is the moon's orbit is tipped about five degrees to the Earth's orbit around the sun. What that means is most of the time during new moon, the moon's shadow passes above the Earth and misses us, or it passes below the Earth and misses us. But at least twice a year, some part of that shadow sweeps over the Earth during new moon, and we get some type of an eclipse. In this case, it's a partial eclipse because only the penumbra is hitting the Earth and the umbra is missing us entirely. But once every 12 to 18 to 24 months, the central shadow the umbra hits the earth and we get a total eclipse. Now everybody's been told that total eclipses are extremely rare. Well, in this sense they're not because we get a total eclipse every year or two. The rareness is it's very unusual to get an eclipse, a total eclipse at a specific location on the earth. Even though you get a total eclipse every year or two, Last year, there was one in Australia. Uh, go back a couple of years, there was one in Antarctica. Um, you've got to travel around the world to see where this shadow is because the path is so small. So it's rare to get one at a specific location like Vincennes. How did I get involved in eclipses? Well, back in 1963, I was an amateur astronomer and there was a partial eclipse that I watched as a kid and I got very excited about it and I started reading about it and I had a little golden book of stars that had this map in it that showed upcoming eclipses in the 1970s, 80s and 90s and I saw that there was a total eclipse that went through the eastern United States and I said, wow, my one chance in a lifetime to see a total eclipse of the sun. I put it on my calendar, I was 12 years old got to see it. And I waited. 1970 rolled around. I was a, a senior in high school. I was the age of many of you out in the audience. I had just gotten my driver's license. My parents let me borrow the car, unchaperoned, to drive 600 miles to get into the path of totality in North Carolina. I had a little telescope with me. Here's, here's the path of the 1970 eclipse. I had a little telescope with me. I had a camera. I actually managed to get some photographs of that first eclipse. And I had read a lot about the eclipse. I was, felt that I was really prepared to see this event, but I was wrong. After the eclipse was over, I realized this cannot be a once in a lifetime event for me. I've got to see another one. It was so beautiful, so startling, so ethereal in beauty. The corona was, was just burned into my memory. Well, 
The next one was in um, Canada. The one after that was in Africa. And before I knew it, I was going on these long, long trips all over the world to see total eclipses. Each spot on this map represents a location where I've watched a total solar eclipse, or at least traveled to see it. I don't see them all because sometimes you have bad weather and you get clouded out and you miss the eclipse. But over the past 50 years, I've traveled to every continent and been to 30 total solar eclipses. And you might be wondering why. <laughs> what is this obsession? What is so special about seeing a total eclipse of the sun? Let's go back in history and see what some of the great astronomers have said about total eclipses. Up until uh, after uh, Galileo invented the telescope in 1610, and no modern scientific Europeans had seen an eclipse up to that point, and it, they didn't get a total eclipse through Europe until 1715. And Edmund Halley was an important astronomer in those days, and he got very excited about this opportunity to see an eclipse. He wasn't really that interested in the sun. He was interested in the moon's orbit because Isaac Newton had just pr produced his grand uh, publication on basically uh, the theory of gravity in his book, Principia. And Halley used Newton's theory to predict where the eclipse path was going to go, and he produced one of the very first eclipse maps over here in the, on the right-hand side. And he was interested in measuring how accurate his predictions were and to figure out where the eclipse path was. So he instituted the first project involving citizen science. He, he had it, handed out these handbills with the map and asked the citizens of England to watch the eclipse on eclipse day, use their pendulum clocks, and time how long the total phase of the eclipse lasts, which is typically only a few minutes. And he was able to get an idea of where the eclipse crossed in England to refine his maps and ultimately to figure out a better orbit for the moon. But at the same time, he made some observations during totality. And this is what he had to say. Well, it looks like it's not going to play. Well, he noticed a luminous ring around the, the sun during totality. He didn't know what it was caused by. He thought it was interesting. Um, but he was, again, he was mainly interested in the path of the moon. But other astronomers took note. But their next opportunity to try to see this event again was a century later, in 1842. Again, a, a, an eclipse path through Europe. This time, it went through Spain and Italy and into Eastern Europe and through Asia. And uh, one astronomer, another British astronomer, uh, Francis Bailey, uh, decided to, to travel to Italy to see this eclipse and make some observations. That's not cooperating with me here. applause from the streets below, and at the same moment was electrified at the sight of one of the most brilliant and splendid phenomena that can well be imagined. At that instant the dark body of the moon was suddenly surrounded with a corona or kind of bright glory. Similar in shape and relative magnitude to that which painters draw round the heads of saints. When the total obscuration took place, which was instantaneous, there was an universal shout from every observer. I had indeed anticipated the appearance of a luminous circle round the moon during the time of total obscurity. But I did not expect, from any of the accounts of preceding eclipses that I had read, to witness so magnificent an exhibition as that which took place. Well, what happens 
during when the total obscuration took place, which was instantaneous. Let's follow the progress of, of what it looks like on eclipse day. Every total eclipse begins with the partial phases, where a small nibble is taken out of the edge of the sun, and it progressively gets larger and larger. And it takes an hour, an hour and a quarter, for the moon to slowly creep across the sun's entire face. And during this period of time, if you didn't have any kind of a solar filter, you wouldn't know anything was going on because the remaining sun is so bright that it looks like normal daylight. It's only when you start to get towards the last 10 minutes or so before the eclipse goes total that you start to notice the light starting to fade. It looks a little funny. It just doesn't look natural. The temperature starts dropping too, especially in the last 10 minutes. It might dry, drop 10 or 15 degrees even though the sun is still relatively bright in the sky. Birds start acting weird. They'll start roosting like it's sunset. In the last minute, you might start seeing these strange wavy ripples racing across the, the landscape. They look a lot like uh, the reflections in the bottom of a swimming pool, those, those pale shady ripples moving across the, the bottom of a pool. These are called um, shadow bands, and they're produced by sunlight shining through the thin crescent, shining through the different temperature layers in the Earth's atmosphere. And it's, it's related to the same physics that causes stars to twinkle or to see mirages down a highway on a hot summer day. In the last minute, the sun shrinks to an incredibly thin crescent, hair thin, and then the lights start going out. The sky gets darker, the crescent shrinks to a bead, and you start to see the corona come into view because the corona isn't getting brighter, the sky is getting darker, and you start to see the black disk of the moon appear. The, the bead disappears, and now you're in this very strange twilight, and the sun's corona is directly visible to the naked eye. And you can look at this with, without any solar filters or anything, directly with the naked eye. Looking around the horizon, you're in a very strange twilight. You've gone from bright sunlight to this twilight in only 30 seconds. Now, it's not as dark as night, but your eyes haven't adjusted because you've gone from bright sunlight to this twilight, so it seems a lot darker than it is. But it's about as dark as the sky gets, about a half hour to 40 minutes after sunset, when it's dark enough to just pick out a couple of the brightest stars in the sky, and maybe a few planets. But again, you, you're plunged into this twilight so quickly that it's very startling. It makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, your stomach, your heartbeat race, and you get this, this visceral feeling in your gut that something is wrong with nature. Nature seems askew. This is not everyday life here. You've never seen anything like this in your life. And it seems like the minutes tick by as, as quick as seconds. And suddenly you see a string of beads along one edge of the dark sun. This is sunlight reappearing along the deepest valleys of the moon as the sun starts to reemerge from behind the moon. Those beads merge together. The beads are called Bailey's beads because Francis Bailey first described them. The beads merge together to form a diamond again. The sky starts growing bright. The, the corona fades from view. Um, you have to put your solar glasses back on because now it's getting too bright to look at. And it's usually at this point to you that you turn to your family and your friends and ask each other, when is the next total solar eclipse? because you've seen something like you've never experienced before. Well, the last total eclipse through the US was seven years ago. Anybody in the audience see that total eclipse? Excellent, yeah. Um, 12 million people lived in the path of totality. The path was about um, uh, 100, uh, 90, 90, 100, uh, no, 70 miles wide. 
and the moon's shadow swept across the earth um, at a, an extremely fast velocity. Um, over a thousand miles an hour, 1500 miles an hour. And it only took uh, an hour and a half or so to cross from the Pacific coast in Oregon down to the Carolinas. I was in Casper, Wyoming um, with a whole carload full of telescopes. I had 14 telescopes and cameras set up for the eclipse. And uh, this was um, one, the event recorded with one of the telescopes that I had, one of the cameras, showing a wide angle view of the sky as totality proceeded. We're about one minute before totality. Scope filters off. Roy, can I take this off? off? Okay. 15. Okay, filters off, Roy. Video filters off. Video filters off. 40. Oh, man. <laughs> All around the horizon, 360 degrees. Max eclipse in 10 seconds. Oh my God. Max eclipse. eclipse. Oh, Max eclipse. This is a two minute eclipse. 60 seconds to yeah. I see Regulus to the left of the sun. Fifty seconds left. Oh, man. Seconds. Oh, look 11, at that. 10, 9, oh. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Third contact. Oh.
filters on. So here's some of the results from some of the other cameras. Here's a time lapse getting the entire partial phases and totality. We had some serious clouds up in the sky, but it still gave a, a wonderful view of the eclipse. This is a close-up of the corona now um, from one of the telescopes where I shot dozens of photographs, combined them all together to do high, what's called high dynamic range imaging because the inner corona is much brighter than the outer corona. Your eyes can see the entire range, but the photograph can only capture narrow slices. So I have to take all these separate photographs and recombine them to try to reproduce what I saw with the naked eye. And right over there, that star right there is a bright star Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo, the constellation Leo, which was visible with the naked eye during totality. Now, my first love wasn't eclipses. My first love was dinosaurs. And I never outgrew that love. So this was a rare opportunity because I observed the eclipse from the Casper College, which has a geology museum. And in the front of the geology museum, they have this 15-foot tall bronze statue of a T-Rex. So I thought, here's an opportunity to get a picture of a T-Rex with a total solar eclipse. <laughs> now here's another uh, video shot with one of the close-up video cameras of totality. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Twenty. Twenty. You can see those red things along the edge of the disk. Those are prominences seconds. in the sun's atmosphere. 15 seconds. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Third contact. Here come Bailey's beads. Another time lapse showing various phases of the eclipse with totality. But, as I promised, in two months, there's a total eclipse again through North America. It actually begins in the Pacific Ocean. But there are no, there's no land out here. It's just over ocean. The eclipse takes an hour and a half to get to the coast of Mexico. The eclipse is already half over by the time it reaches Mexico. It sweeps over Mexico through central North America into Canada, and it ends in the North Atlantic. That whole thing takes about three and a quarter hours for the moon shadow to move over that track of over 9,000 miles. Through the United States, the eclipse path crosses 15 states. In Canada, eight, prominent, uh, eight provinces. Um, over 32 million people in the United States live in the path of totality, including most of everybody in the audience. The path begin, uh, begins in North America through Mexico, I'll be traveling to where it first hits land there in, uh, in Mazatlan, right down there. It crosses into Texas, uh, into um, Oklahoma, Missouri, of course, uh, Illinois and Indiana, Ohio, uh, New York, parts of Pennsylvania, um, Ontario, Vermont, Quebec. New Hampshire, Maine, New Brunswick, uh, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland before ending in the North Atlantic. 
Well, what about Vincennes? Here we are. You guys are right in the middle of the path. As you move from the center of the path out to the edges, the duration gets shorter and shorter and shorter. If you were right on the edges of the path, it would last a second. But in the middle of the path, you get the maximum amount. And for, for Vincennes, that's four minutes and five seconds. And here are the local eclipse times here. So the partial phase doesn't begin until mid-afternoon, 1.47 p.m. Over an hour later, totality begins at 3.03, lasts for four, a little over four minutes, it ends at 3.07, and then you get more of a partial phase for another hour and a half until 4.21 when the partial phase ends. How frequently do total eclipses occur in a lo one location? Well, the last total eclipse in Vincennes was in 1869, or rather the last total eclipse in Indiana was in uh, 1869. The next one is in 2099. So if you just want to stay in, in Indiana, uh, this is your one chance. If you cross the river and go into Illinois, where did I jump? Oops. Oh, I guess I don't have that slide in here. Okay. How to safely view a, a total eclipse. Two, there are two basic phases uh, that we're interested in in terms of observing. There are the partial phases and then totality. During the partial phases, um, there are many ways to observe um, the partial phases. The simplest way is to just go underneath a shade tree. The sunlight passing through the leaves. I don't know if you'll have any leaves by April. Maybe. Um, the, the leaves act like pinholes. So little beads of sunlight shining through the leaves produce pinholes on the ground, and you actually see the crescents of the sun on the ground underneath any tree. If you have a, rob the, the, the kitchen and take out a, a, a vegetable strainer or, or a kitchen colander and hold that up, it actually projects images of, of the eclipse onto a piece of cardboard onto the ground below it. Fun little experiment to do during the partial phases. But the best way to watch it is using these eclipse glasses that you can buy online, even uh, some big box stores like Lowe's and, and Walmart might be selling eclipse glasses for a, a couple of bucks each. These are the easiest way to watch the partial phases. Uh, some of the companies that make them are um, American Paper Optics, um, Rainbow Symphony, Thousand Oaks Optical, all make solar eclipse glasses that are safe. Now, the good news is during totality, you take the glasses off and use no eclipse glasses during the total phase. Now, you might wonder, how do I know exactly when it's safe to look? And if you're around other people watching the eclipse, when the moon shadow sweeps over, first of all, it'll get dark immediately, very quickly, in 10 seconds. And everybody around you will be screaming like the home team just made a touchdown. So you will know it's safe to look at the eclipse then, and it'll be dark. When the sun starts reappearing four minutes later and it gets too bright to look at, you know it's time to put the eclipse glasses back on. So where can you find out more about the April eclipse? Well, I've got a website for, to remember, eclipsewise.com 2024 slash. I've got a lot of information on there about the eclipse information about safe solar filters, how to view the different stages, some basics about uh, geometry of eclipses. And I've also got a really neat Google map on there. And it, you can zoom into this Google map. Like here, I've zoomed into Dallas. If you click on the map with your mouse pointer, 
it'll pop up a window and it tells you how long the eclipse lasts at that location and when it starts and when it ends. So you can do that for any location. So if you don't happen to be directly in Vincennes, you can use this map to figure out where it is from your farm or a neighboring town to get the eclipse times for that location. All of that stuff can be found on eclipsewise.com slash 2024 slash. Uh, some of the other stuff, there are animations on there, links to past eclipses, uh, information about the partial phases. So there's a lot of information, as well as, as the local uh, Vincennes website for the eclipse, which I don't remember the address to, but I'm sure they'll, they'll mention it again. So I hope that on April 8th, Vincennes has spectacular weather for the next and last total solar eclipse for many, many years in this part of the country. Thank you very much. I guess we have some time for questions, yes? Sure. If, if anyone would have some questions. Uh... Yes. Um, yeah, there is a comet um, that might be in the sky um, during the eclipse, but Comets are notoriously hard to predict in terms of, it's easy to predict where they will be, but it's almost impossible to predict how bright they will be. And it's very unlikely that that comet will be visible to the naked eye during the eclipse. Uh, comets are normally very faint. It's rare that you've got a really bright comet. We had one a couple of years ago called Comet Neowise that you could see just for a week or two in the summer, but you needed a dark sky to see it. You couldn't see it in the daytime. And even in the twilight of totality, it's, the sky is going to be too bright to see that comet. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's unlikely. There's, there has not been a naked eye comet during a total eclipse in all the 30 total eclipses I've been to over the past 50 years. So it's a very rare event. Yes? Ah, really make it stand out. What, what was my favorite or most memorable eclipse? Um, I've, I've given a lot of talks on eclipses, and I'm often asked that question. And um, my wife was at one of my talks. Um, she's heard my talks so many times, she doesn't go to very many of them. But she went to one a few years ago, and she said, you're answering that question wrong. <laughs> and I said, oh? She corrected me and pointed out that my favorite eclipse was the one that we made, met at in India in 1995. <laughs> so that's my favorite eclipse. <laughs> but a second favorite one was in Mexico in 1991 because the sun was almost directly overhead and totality lasted over six minutes. So that was, that was spectacular. And the weather was crystal clear perfect. Thank you for the question, though. Yes? Doing it on my own. I, what I was doing for NASA was the calculations and the predictions. But the actual going to the eclipses I was doing on my own, on my vacation time, because I was passionate about it. It was something I wanted to do. And I want, didn't want to have to rely on writing a proposal and getting funded to do it. I was going one way or another, so I just cut NASA out of the loop there and did it myself. <laughs> yes? How many days in advance do people show up? Oh, uh, and how many days in advance do people show up? Um, typically, well, it depends on how serious an eclipse chaser you are. I mean, there, there'll be thousands and thousands of people showing up in Vincennes on eclipse day. But a smaller number of them will show up a, a day or two or three days earlier. Um, I'm typically at an eclipse location 
several days before the eclipse. I'll be going down to Mexico five days before the eclipse takes place because I want to take a chance that there is a flight delay and I have to catch a flight a day or two later and that might be on eclipse day and I miss the eclipse. Yes? This time, well, it's those darn old airlines limiting how much luggage you can take. Plus, that, that, that the 17 cameras in uh, Wyoming almost killed me. It was, that was too many. So I'm just going to have about seven cameras. One telescope and a couple of long telephoto lenses, and then several cameras that are just wide-angle cameras like GoPros. Yes? We have an alternative. We, um, part of the problem with, with cloudiness is you often don't know, just because it's cloudy six hours before the eclipse at a location doesn't mean it's going to be cloudy there during the eclipse. I've heard of people say, oh, it's cloudy here, and they, they take off and they go 100 miles away, and it could be cloudy there and clear where they left. So you have to look at the forecast, see what the forecasts are telling you. But we do have a, another location in Mexico uh, that we'll be leaving for the morning, morning of the eclipse. But we're really relying on forecasts for that, of whether it's going to be cloudy in one spot versus another. And it's hard to change your position within an hour or two of, of the eclipse itself, especially when you've got thousands and thousands of people with the same idea, all jumping on the highway at the same time. But it's, 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 it's possible. It's, it's challenging. It's better to rely on forecasts and figure out what you're going to do. Uh, for instance, if you looked at the forecast um, in April, April 6th, and it looks like it's going to be cloudy in Vincennes but clear in Indianapolis, I would drive up to Indianapolis the night before. But that's just me. Yes? Um, the advantage of going to Mexico, the duration is a little bit longer. I get almost four minutes and 30 seconds. But the real advantage is the climatology, the studies of w how frequently it's cloudy in one spot versus another, suggests, statistically speaking, it's more likely to be clear in Mexico than it is any other place along the eclipse path. Now, that's climate and statistics. On eclipse day, you don't get those, you get weather. And I have seen satellite maps, I've been looking at satellite maps for the past 10 years, and I have seen days when it's been clear every place, any place along the path, or cloudy any place along the path. So it's a bit of a crapshoot. It's, it's, just, it's just a matter of, of being lucky and being in the right place at the right time. Picking the, the climatology just hedges your bets a little bit, but it's no guarantee. And I've been clouded out of about qu a quarter of those eclipses that I've been to. The uh, up here. Yes. Up, up here. Yes. Uh, really enjoyed the video that you shared from 17. Yes. The tempo and countdown that we heard with the uh, announcements of time. Yes. Is that a system you created yourself? Um, it's actually, no, someone else created it, and they've now come out with, with a version um, that you can put on a smartphone. It doesn't matter whether, whether it's an iPhone or an Android. It's, it's an app that has the memorable name Solar Eclipse Timer app. <laughs> the app is free, but then you have to buy the data for 2024 Eclipse which is $1.99. But I, I strongly recommend it. Um, and you can get it turned on. And not only that, it uses the GPS in your phone to determine where you are, and it calculates the times for that location. So it doesn't matter where you are in the eclipse path. You can use this app, and it'll give you those timings. And that's a great way to know when to take your filters on and off, because it'll give you announcements. Solar Eclipse Timer app. Thank you.
Yes. Um, the, the glasses have to be on the, the, ca the camera, not you. You can't look at it, but if you have to put the glasses on the, the, the camera itself to shoot through that. And you can, you can try it before the, on any sunny day before the eclipse. See if you can get a picture of the normal sun during the daytime with your camera. But it's got, the sun's going to be very, very tiny in an in a iPhone or, or a cell phone. Um, if you want to try to take pictures during totality with, with, a, with a simple camera like a, like a <coughs> cell phone, my recommendation is if you don't have a little tripod or something, prop it up on a fence or a wall and sh shoot video. Maybe five or ten minutes before the eclipse starts, just start it up showing the landscape with the sun in the field of view and maybe people in the foreground and just start the video and let it run for 10 or 15 minutes throughout totality. You'll know, capture all the excitement, all the people screaming and yelling. You'll get a little image of the sun up in the corner, and it works great. Yes? Yes. We're, going, we're reaching a point of solar maximum um, where the sun is very active, There are a lot of storms. There's a lot of magnetic activity. We're getting a lot of aurora visible um, at higher latitudes, not so much here, but uh, up in Alaska and Iceland and Norway. Um, and that has an effect on um, the shape of the corona. The corona, because the sun is so magnetically active, you get many more streamers going every which way, and it sort of randomizes the corona, and you get a very spiky shaped corona, and typically a little brighter than normal, and maybe more of those red prominences that stick out around the edge of the moon's disk during totality. But nobody can predict it very accurately in advance. But it should, it should have an effect. Yes? That is correct. It doesn't seem fair, <laughs> but it is correct. They just happen to be at the crossroads of two total eclipses. It's very unusual, but it happens. <coughs> well, if you look at a, a map of, of past and future eclipses, you'll find that eclipses frequently crisscross at one particular location. It might be in Europe, it might be in Asia or Africa. Um, <coughs> and it's unusual. I mean, it's, it's not unusual that it crisscrosses, it's unusual that you happen to be where it crisscrosses. But it happens all the time. Carbondale just had the luck of the draw and got, got to be in the crisscross spot for this particular eclipse. But they may not get another eclipse for, for many hundreds of years. Yes? Could you expand on the safety glasses and the ISO rating uh, for filters? Uh, the ISO ratings is, is a, a scientific a, a determination of what filter materials are safe. And the major um, solar eclipse glass manufacturers are adhering to those standards to protect your eyesight. So if it's, if it's got that ISO standard on the hoof glasses, then you know that they're safe. And those companies, like I mentioned, Rainbow Symphony, uh, Thousand Oaks Optical, um, American Paper Optics, all adhere to those ISO guidelines. Yes? Sorry? I've got, I've got a few more presentations, and then I've got to start preparing what I'm doing for the eclipse. So it's, it's a very busy time for me. Yes, over here. I think the beauty of the corona, 
was certainly the overwhelming thing and how, how, how as spectacular it is when, when you're plunged into this twilight. There's, there's a, a sense that man likes to think he can control nature. We, we're on top of everything. But we can't. And that comes to light more than any other time during a solar eclipse because the, you know the eclipse is going to happen. You've got the date and the time. And there's absolutely nothing in our power to, to change that. It's going to happen whether we're there or not, whether it's clear or not. And it gives, it, it gives you a, 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 a sense of humility about how small uh, we are in the universe and how we're part of the whole thing now. Let's give Fred another round of applause. Okay, uh, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, on March 15th, we will, the will be hosting a how to photograph an eclipse workshop at our Shake Learning Resource Center at 1.30 p.m. on Friday, March 15th. So if you do want to find out about how to do that, VU Professor Chris Schneeberger will be uh, doing that. And again, if you go to vincenseclipse.com, uh, all the activities, things going on um, in this community are, are, can be found there. Also, on your way out, uh, the Red Skelton Museum is open for free. So if you would like to uh, visit that, they'll be open for an hour uh, here after after our talk, but thank you so much for coming and hope we'll see you in Vincennes on April 8th. <laughs>